Section 28 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Butterick. Common Sense in the Household. A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harland. Vegetables, beans, rice, etc. French or string or snap beans break off the tops and bottoms and string carefully then pare both edges with a sharp knife to be certain that no remnant of the tough fiber remains not one cook in a hundred performs this duty as deftly and thoroughly as it should be done i have heard several gentlemen say that they could always tell after the first mouthful whether the mistress or the hireling had strung the beans it is a tedious and disagreeable business this pulling bits of woody thread out of one's mouth when he wants to enjoy his dinner cut the beans thus cleared of their troublesome attaches in pieces an inch long and lay in cold water with a little salt for fifteen or twenty minutes drain them and put them in a saucepan of boiling water boil quickly twenty minutes if well grown less if small at any rate until tender drain in a colander until the water ceases to drip from them dish with a great spoonful of butter stirred in to my taste beans need to have a bit of bacon boiled with them whole or chopped into bits that dissolve in the boiling it mellows the rank taste you seek to remove by boiling lima and butter beans shell into cold water let them lie a while put into a pot with plenty of boiling water and a little salt and cook fast until tender large ones sometimes require nearly an hour's boiling the average time is forty minutes drain and butter well when dished peppering to taste kidney and other small beans shell into cold water and cook in boiling until tender a small piece of fat bacon boiled with them is an advantage to nearly all if you do this do not salt them dried beans wash and soak overnight in lukewarm water changing it several times for warmer if this is done they will require but two hours boiling drain very thoroughly pressing them firmly but lightly in the colander with a wooden spoon salt pepper and mix in a great lump of butter when they are dished boiled beets wash but do not touch with a knife before they are boiled if cut while raw they bleed themselves pale in the hot water boil until tender if full grown at least two hours when done rub off the skins slice round if large split if young and butter well in the dish salt and pepper to taste a nice way is to slice them upon a hot dish mix a great spoonful of melted butter with four or five of vinegar pepper and salt heat to boiling and pour over the beets instead of consigning the cold ones left over to the swill pail pour cold vinegar upon them and use them as pickles with cold or roast meat stewed beets boil young sweet beets until nearly done skin and slice them put into a saucepan with minced shallot and parsley two tablespoons full melted butter a like quantity of vinegar some salt and pepper set on the fire and simmer twenty minutes shaking the saucepan now and then serve with the gravy poured over them boiled parsnips if young scrape before cooking if old pare carefully and if large split put into boiling water salted and boil if small and tender from half to three-quarters of an hour if full grown more than an hour when tender drain and slice lengthwise buttering well when you dish fried parsnips boil until tender scrape off the skin and cut in thick lengthwise slices dredge with flour and fry in hot dripping or lard turning when one side is browned drain off every drop of fat pepper and serve hot parsnip fritters boil tender mash smooth and fine picking out the woody bits 
for three large parsnips allow two eggs one cup rich milk one tablespoonful butter one teaspoonful salt three tablespoonfuls flour beat the eggs light stir in the mashed parsnips beating hard then the butter and salt next the milk lastly the salt fry as fritters or as griddle cakes mashed parsnips boil and scrape them mash smooth with the back of a wooden spoon or a potato beetle picking out the fibers mix in three or four spoonfuls of cream a great spoonful of butter pepper and salt to taste heat to boiling in a saucepan and serve keep in a mound as you would potato cooked in the same way buttered parsnips boil tender and scrape slice a quarter of an inch thick lengthwise put into a saucepan with three tablespoonfuls melted butter pepper and salt and a little chopped parsley shake over the fire until the mixture boils lay the parsnips in order upon a dish pour the sauce over them and garnish with parsley it is a pleasant addition to this dish to stir a few spoonfuls of cream into the sauce after the parsnips are taken out boil up and pour upon them boiled sea kale tie up in bunches when you have picked it over carefully and lay in cold water for an hour put into salted boiling water and cook twenty or thirty minutes until tender lay some slices of buttered toast in the bottom of a dish clip the threads binding the stems of the sea kale and pile upon the toast buttering it abundantly or you can send around with it a boat of drawn butter stewed sea kale clip off the stems wash well tie in neat bunches and when it has lain in cold water for an hour or so put into a saucepan of boiling water slightly salted boil fifteen minutes drain well clip the threads and return to the saucepan with a little rich gravy if you have it if not pour in three or four tablespoonfuls of drawn butter in the milk pepper and salt and simmer eight or ten minutes artichokes strip off the outer leaves and cut the stalks close to the bottom wash well and lay in cold water for two hours immerse in boiling water the stalk ends uppermost with an inverted plate upon them to keep them down boil an hour and a half or until very tender arrange in circles upon a dish the tops up and pour drawn butter over them summer squash or cymbling there are many varieties of this vegetable but the general rules for cooking them are the same unless they are extremely tender it is best to pare them cutting away as little as possible besides the hard outer rind take out the seeds when you have quartered them and lay the pieces in cold water boil until tender throughout drain well pressing out all the water mash soft and smooth seasoning with butter pepper and salt do this quickly that you may serve it up hot winter squash pair take out the seeds cut into small pieces and stew until soft and tender drain press well to rid it of all water and mash with butter pepper and salt it will take much longer to cook than summer squash and before you put it into hot water should lie in cold at least two hours stewed pumpkin cut in two extract the seeds slice and pair cover with cold water for an hour put over the fire in a pot of boiling water and stew gently stirring often until it breaks to pieces drain and squeeze rub through a colander then return to the saucepan with a tablespoonful of butter pepper and salt to taste stir rapidly from the bottom until very hot when dish rounding into a mound with dabs of pepper on the top baked pumpkin choose the richest pumpkin you can find take out the seeds cut in quarters or eighths pare and slice lengthwise half an inch thick arrange in layers not more than two or three slices deep in a shallow but broad baking dish put a very little water in the bottom and bake very slowly until not only done but dry it requires a long time for the heat should be gentle butter each strip on both sides when you dish and eat hot with bread and butter for tea i have been assured by people who have tried it that this is a palatable dish to those who are fond of the flavor of pumpkin i insert it here upon their recommendation not my own poke stalks 
when the young stalks are not larger than a man's little finger and show only a tuft of leaves at top a few inches above ground is the time to gather them they are unfit for table use when larger and older scrape the stalks but do not cut off the leaves lay in cold water with a little salt for two hours tie in bundles as you do asparagus put into a saucepan of boiling water and cook fast three quarters of an hour lay buttered toast on the bottom of a dish untie the bundles and pile the poke evenly upon it buttering very well and sprinkling with pepper and salt this is a tolerable substitute for asparagus mushrooms imprimis have nothing to do with them until you are an excellent judge between the true and false that sounds somewhat like the advice of the careful mother to her son touching the wisdom of never going near the water until he learned how to swim but the caution can hardly be stated too strongly not being ambitious of martyrdom even in the cause of gastronomical enterprise especially if the instrument is to be a contemptible rank-smelling fungus i never eat or cook native mushrooms but i learned years ago in the hillside rambles how to distinguish the real from the spurious article shun low damp shady spots in your quest the good mushrooms are most plenty in august and september and spring up in the open sunny fields or commons after low-lying fogs or soaking dews the top is a dirty white par complaisance pearl-colored the underside pink or salmon changing to russet or brown soon after they are gathered the poisonous sport all colors and are usually far prettier than their virtuous kindred those which are dead white above and below as well as the stalk are also to be let alone cook a peeled white onion in the pot with your mushrooms if it turns black throw all away and be properly thankful for your escape it is also deemed safe to reject the mess of wild pottage if in stirring them your silver spoon should blacken but i certainly once knew a lady who did not discover until hers were eaten and partially digested that the silver had come to grief in the discharge of duty it was very dark and required a deal of rubbing to restore cleanliness and polish but the poison if death were indeed in the pot was slow in its effects since she lived many years after the experiment it is as well perhaps though not to repeat it too often to recapitulate the eatable ones are round when they first show their heads in a critical world as they grow the lower part unfolds a lining of salmon fringe while the stalk and top are dirty white when the mushroom is more than twenty-four hours old or within a few hours after it is gathered the salmon changes to brown the skin can also be more easily peeled from the edges than in the spurious kinds stewed mushrooms choose button mushrooms of uniform size wipe clean and white with a wet flannel cloth and cut off the stalks put into a porcelain saucepan cover with cold water and stew very gently fifteen minutes salt to taste add a tablespoonful of butter divided into bits and rolled in flour boil three or four minutes stir in three or four tablespoonfuls of cream whipped up with an egg stir two minutes without letting it boil and serve or rub them white stew in water ten minutes strain partially and cover with as much warm milk as you have poured off water stew five minutes in this salt and pepper and add some veal or chicken gravy or drawn butter thicken with a little flour wet in cold milk and a beaten egg baked mushrooms take fresh ones the size is not very important cut off nearly all the stalks and wipe off the skin with a wet flannel arrange neatly in a pie dish pepper and salt sprinkle a little mace among them and lay a bit of butter upon each bake about a half an hour basting now and then with butter and water that they may not be too dry serve in the dish in which they were baked with maitre d'hotel sauce poured over them broiled mushrooms peel the finest and freshest you can get score the underside and cut the stems close put into a deep dish and anoint well once again with melted butter salt and pepper and let them lie in the butter an hour and a half 
then broil over a clear hot fire using an oyster gridiron and turning it over as one side browns serve hot well buttered pepper and salt and squeeze a few drops of lemon juice on each celery wash and scrape the stalks when you have cut off the roots cut off the green leaves and reject the greenest toughest stalks retain the blanched leaves that grow nearest the heart keep in cold water until you send to table serve in a celery glass and let each guest dip in salt for himself see celery salad stewed celery one bunch of celery scraped trimmed and cut to inch lengths one cup milk one great spoonful of butter rolled in flour pepper and salt stew the celery in clear water until tender turn off the water add the milk and as soon as this boils seasoning and butter boil up once and serve very hot radishes a friend of mine after many and woeful trials with the greatest plague of life engaged a supercilious young lady who only hired out in the best of families as a professed cook she arrived in the afternoon and was told that tea would be a simple affair bread and butter cold meat cake and a dish of radishes which were brought in from the garden as the order was given the lady was summoned to the parlor at that moment and remarked in leaving you can prepare those now bridget a while later she peeped into the kitchen attracted by the odor of hot fat the frying pan hissed on the fire the contents were half a pound of butter and the professional stood at the table with the radish topped and tailed in one hand and a knife in the other i'm glad to see ye thus she greeted the intruder is it piled or unpiled ye'll have them radishes some of the quality like some fried with skins on some without i thought i'd wait and ask yourself my readers can exercise their own choice in the matter of peeling putting the frying out of the question wash and lay them in ice water so soon as they are gathered cut off the tops when your breakfast or supper is ready leaving about an inch of the stalk on scrape off the skin if you choose but the red ones are prettier if you do not arrange in a tall glass or round glass saucer the stalks outside the points meeting in the center lay cracked ice among them and send to table scrape and quarter the large white ones good radishes are crisp to the teeth look cool and taste hot okra boil the young pods in enough salted hot water to cover them until tender drain thoroughly and when dished pour over them the sauce of three or four spoonfuls melted not drawn butter a tablespoonful of vinegar pepper and salt to taste heat to boiling before covering the okras with it boiled hominy the large kind made of cracked not ground corn is erroneously termed samp by northern grocers this is the indian name for the fine grained to avoid confusion we will call the one large the other small soak the large overnight in cold water next day put into a pot with at least two quarts of water to a quart of the hominy and boil slowly three hours or until it is soft drain in a colander heap in a root dish and stir in butter pepper and salt soak the small hominy in the same way and boil in as much water slowly stirring very often almost constantly at the last it should be as thick as mush and is generally eaten at breakfast with sugar cream and nutmeg it is a good and exceedingly wholesome dish especially for children the water in which it is boiled should be slightly salted if soaked in warm water and the same be changed once or twice for warmer it will boil soft in an hour boil in the last water fried hominy if large put a good lump of butter or dripping in the fry pan and heat turn in some cold boiled hominy and cook until the underside is browned place a dish upside down on the fry pan and upset the latter that the brown crust may be uppermost eat with meat cut the small hominy in slices and fry in hot lard or drippings or moisten to a soft paste with milk beat in some melted butter bind with a beaten egg form into round cakes with your hands dredge with flour and fry a light brown hominy croquettes 
to a cupful of cold boiled hominy small grained add a tablespoonful melted butter and stir hard moistening by degrees with a little milk beating to a soft light paste put in a teaspoonful of white sugar and lastly a well-beaten egg roll into oval balls with floured hands dip in beaten egg then cracker crumbs and fry in hot lard very good baked hominy to a cupful of cold boiled hominy small kind allow two cups of milk a heaping teaspoonful of butter a teaspoonful of white sugar a little salt and three eggs beat the eggs very light yolks and whites separately work the yolks first into the hominy alternately with the melted butter when thoroughly mixed put in sugar and salt and go on beating while you soften the batter gradually with the milk be careful to leave no lumps in the hominy lastly stir in the whites and bake in a buttered pudding dish until light firm and delicately browned this can be eaten as a dessert but it is a delightful vegetable and the best substitute that can be devised for green corn pudding rice croquettes half a cup of rice one pint milk two tablespoonfuls sugar three eggs a little grated lemon peel one tablespoonful melted butter a salt spoonful salt soak the rice three hours in warm water enough to cover it drain almost dry and pour in the milk stew in a farina kettle or one saucepan set in another of hot water until the rice is very tender add the sugar butter and and salt and simmer ten minutes whisk the eggs to a froth and add cautiously taking the saucepan from the fire while you whip them into the mixture return to the range or stove and stir while they thicken not allowing them to boil remove the saucepan and add the grated lemon peel then turn out upon a well-greased dish to cool when cold and stiff flour your hands and roll into oval or pear-shaped balls dip in beaten egg then in fine cracker crumbs and fry in nice lard or you can make a plainer dish of cold boiled rice moistened with milk and a little melted butter to a smooth paste add sugar and salt bind with two or three beaten eggs make into cakes or balls and proceed as directed above eat hot with roast or boiled fowls if you shape like a pear stick a clove in the small end for the stem boiled rice pick over carefully and wash in two waters letting it stand in the last until you are ready to boil have ready some boiling water slightly salted and put in the rice boil it just twenty minutes and do not put a spoon in it but shake up hard and often holding the cover on with the other hand when done drain off the water and set the saucepan uncovered upon the range where the rice will dry not burn for five minutes eat with boiled mutton or fowls baked macaroni break half a pound of pipe macaroni in pieces an inch long and put into a saucepan of boiling water slightly salted stew gently twenty minutes it should be soft but not broken or split drain well and put a layer in the bottom of a buttered pie or pudding dish upon this grate some mild rich cheese and scatter over it some bits of butter spread upon the cheese more macaroni and fill the dish in this order having macaroni at the top buttered well without the cheese add a few spoonfuls of cream or milk and a very little salt bake covered half an hour then brown nicely and serve in the bake dish stewed macaroni italian style break the macaroni into inch lengths and stew twenty minutes or until tender prepare the sauce beforehand cut half a pound of beef into strips and stew half an hour the water should be cold when the meat is put in at the end of that time add a minced onion and a pint of tomatoes peeled and sliced boil for an hour and strain through a colander when you have taken out the meat the sauce should be well boiled down by this time you do not want more than a pint for a large dish of macaroni return the liquid to the saucepan add a good piece of butter with pepper and salt and stew until you are ready to dish the macaroni 
drain this well sprinkle lightly with salt and heap on a chafing dish or in a root dish pour the tomato sauce over it cover and let it stand in a warm place ten minutes before sending to table send around grated cheese with it the italians serve the meat also in a separate dish as a ragout adding some of the sauce highly seasoned with pepper and other spices macaroni a la creme cook the macaroni ten minutes in boiling water drain this off add a cupful of milk with a little salt stew until tender in another saucepan heat a cup of milk to boiling thicken with a teaspoonful of flour stir in a tablespoonful of butter and lastly a beaten egg when this thickens pour over the macaroni after it is dished this is a simple and good dessert eaten with butter sugar and nutmeg or sweet sauce if set on with meat grate cheese thickly over it or send around a saucer of grated cheese with it end of section twenty eight Recording by Tracy Butterick. Section twenty nine of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Common Sense in the Household A Manual of Practical Housewifery by marion harlan eggs to guess i do not say determine whether an egg is good shut one eye frame the egg in the hollow of the hand telescope wise and look at the sun through it with the open eye if you can distinctly trace the outline of the yolk and the white looks clear around it the chances are in favor of the egg and the buyer or shake it gently at your ear if addled it will gurgle like water if there is a chicken inside you may distinguish a slight thud against the sides of the egg or still again you may try eggs from your own poultry yard by putting them into a pan of cold water the freshest sink first those that float are questionable generally worse the best plan is to break them in making cake or anything that requires more than one break each over a saucer that it may be alone in its condemnation if bad reject doubtful ones without hesitation yield implicit trust or none at all keep eggs in a cool not cold place pack in bran or salt with a small end downward if you wish to use within two or three weeks and furthermore take the precaution to grease them well with linseed oil or wash them over with a weak solution of gum trichanthus or varnish this excludes the air another way is to make some pretty strong lime water allowing a pound of lime to a gallon of boiling water when perfectly cold fill a large jar with it in which you have packed the eggs small end downward lay a light saucer upon the top to keep them under water and keep in a cool place renew the lime water every three weeks you may add an ounce of saltpetre to it eggs for boiling may be canned as follows so soon as they are brought in from the nests put two or three dozen at a time in a deep pan pour scalding water over them let it stand thirty seconds and turn it all off cover immediately with more scalding water and repeat the process yet the third time wipe dry and pack in bran or salt when they cool this hardens the albumen into an air-tight case for the yolk of course you cannot use these eggs for cake or syllabubs or anything that is prepared with whipped eggs packed with a small end down boiled eggs put into a saucepan of boiling water with a tablespoon not to break or crack them only a slovenly cook or a careless one drops them in with her fingers boil steadily three minutes if you want them soft ten if hard another way is to put them on in cold water and let it come to a boil which will be in ten minutes the inside white and yolk will be then of the consistency of custard many gourmands like them best thus still another is to put them in one of the silver egg boilers used on the breakfast table a covered bowl will do as well cover them with boiling water and let them stand three minutes pour this off and refill with more also boiling hot and leave them in it five minutes longer wrap in a napkin in a deep dish if you have not a regular egg dish 
dropped or poached eggs strain some boiling water into a frying pan which must also be perfectly clean the least impurity will mar the whiteness of the eggs when the water boils break the eggs separately into a saucer take the frying pan off and slip the eggs one by one carefully upon the surface when all are in put back over the fire and boil gently three minutes take out with a perforated skimmer drain and lay upon slices of buttered toast in a hot dish garnish with parsley and dust with pepper and salt poached eggs a la creme nearly fill a clean frying pan with strained water boiling hot strain a tablespoonful of vinegar through double muslin and add to the water with a little salt slip your eggs from the saucer upon the top of the water first taking the pan from the fire boil three minutes and a half drain and lay on buttered toast in a hot dish turn the water from the pan and pour in half a cupful of cream or milk if you use the latter thicken with a very little cornstarch let it heat to a boil stirring to prevent burning and add a great spoonful of butter some pepper and salt boil up once and pour over the eggs a better way still is to heat the milk in a separate saucepan that the eggs may not have to stand a little broth improves the sauce ham and eggs fry the eggs in a little very nice salted lard drain off every drop of grease and lay them upon a hot dish with neat slices of fried ham around the edges half the size of the slice as first carved from the ham trim off the rough edges of the eggs and cut the ham evenly in oblong pieces before dishing garnish with parsley fried eggs melt some butter in a frying pan and when it hisses drop in the eggs carefully fry three minutes dust with pepper and salt and transfer to a hot dish fricasseed eggs boil the eggs hard cut in half crosswise and take out the yolks chop these fine or rub to a paste with a little ground tongue or ham or cold fowl some minced parsley some melted butter and a very little made mustard work well together and fill the whites with it setting them close together in a deep covered dish the open ends up have ready some veal gravy or chicken broth heat to boiling in a saucepan with a half teaspoonful chopped parsley salt pepper and lastly three tablespoonfuls of cream to a cup of broth boil up pour smoking hot over the eggs let them stand five minutes closely covered and send to table this is not an expensive dish eggs are always a cheaper breakfast dish for a small family than meat even at fifty cents a dozen six will make a nice quantity of the fricassee and it is a delicious relish always drop hard-boiled eggs into cold water as soon as they are done to prevent the yolks from turning black breaded eggs boil hard and cut in round thick slices pepper and salt dip each in beaten raw egg then in fine bread crumbs or powdered cracker and fry in nice dripping or butter hissing hot drain off every drop of grease and serve on a hot dish for breakfast with sauce like that for fricasseed eggs poured over them baked eggs break six or seven eggs into a buttered dish taking care that each is whole and does not encroach upon the others so much as to mix or disturb the yolks sprinkle with pepper and salt and put a bit of butter upon each put into an oven and bake until the whites are well set serve very hot with rounds of buttered toast or sandwiches scrambled eggs put a good piece of butter in a frying pan and when it is hot drop in the eggs which should be broken whole into a bowl stir in with them a little chopped parsley some pepper and salt and keep stirring to and fro up and down without cessation for three minutes turn out at once into a hot dish or upon buttered toast and eat without delay chinese bird's nest of eggs make a white sauce as follows stew half a pound of lean veal cut into strips with a large sprig of parsley in a quart of water until the meat is in rags and the liquor reduced one half strain through tarleton or lace and return to the saucepan with half a cupful of milk when it boils thicken with a little rice or wheat flour season with white pepper and salt and the juice of half a lemon set in the corner to keep hot 
have ready six or eight or ten hard-boiled eggs take out the yolks carefully and cut the whites into thin shreds pile the yolks in the centre of a round shallow dish arrange the shreds of white about them in the shape of a bird's nest give a final stir to the sauce and pour carefully over the eggs it should not rise higher in the dish than halfway to the top of the nest when it flows down to its level garnish with parsley scalloped eggs make a force meat of chopped ham ground is better fine bread crumbs pepper salt a little minced parsley and some melted butter moisten with milk to a soft paste and half fill some patty pans or scallop shells with the mixture break an egg carefully upon the top of each dust with pepper and salt and sift some very finely powdered cracker over all set in the oven and bake until the eggs are well set about eight minutes eat hot they are very nice you can substitute ground tongue for the ham poached eggs with sauce make the sauce by putting half a cupful of hot water in a saucepan with a teaspoonful of lemon juice three tablespoonfuls of veal or chicken broth strained pepper salt mace and a tablespoonful of butter with a little minced parsley boil slowly ten minutes and stir in a well whipped egg carefully lest it should curdle have ready some poached eggs in a deep dish and pour the sauce over them eggs upon toast put a good lump of butter into the frying pan when it is hot stir in four or five well beaten eggs with pepper salt and a little parsley stir and toss for three minutes have ready to your hand some slices of buttered toast cut round with a tin cake cutter before they are toasted spread thickly with ground or minced tongue chicken or ham heap the stirred egg upon these in mounds and set in a hot dish garnished with parsley and pickled beets eggs au lit in bed mince some cold fowl chicken turkey or duck or some cold boiled veal and ham in equal quantities very fine and rub in a wedgewood mortar adding by degrees some melted butter pepper salt minced parsley and two beaten eggs warm in a frying pan when it is well mixed stirring in a little hot water should it dry too fast cook five minutes stirring to keep it from scorching or browning form on a hot platter or flat dish into a mound flat on top with a ridge of the mixture running all around it is easily moulded with a broad-bladed knife in the dish thus formed on the top of the mincemeat lay as many poached eggs as it will hold sprinkling them with pepper and salt arrange triangles of buttered toast in such order at the base of the mound that they shall make a pointed wall against it deviled eggs boil six or eight eggs hard leaving cold water until they are cold cut in halves slicing a bit off the bottoms to make them stand upright a la columbus extract the yolks and rub to a smooth paste with a very little melted butter some cayenne pepper a touch of mustard and just a dash of vinegar fill the hollowed whites with this and send to table upon a bed of chopped cresses seasoned with pepper salt vinegar and a little sugar the salad should be two inches thick and an egg be served with a heaping tablespoonful of it you may use lettuce or white cabbage instead of cresses egg baskets make these for breakfast the day after you have had roast chicken duck or turkey for dinner boil six eggs hard cut neatly in half and extract the yolks rub these to a paste with some melted butter pepper and salt and set aside pound the minced meat of the cold fowl fine in the same manner and mix with the egg paste moistening with melted butter as you proceed or with a little gravy if you have it to spare cut off a slice from the bottoms of the hollowed whites of the egg to make them stand fill with the paste arrange close together upon a flat dish and pour over them the gravy left from yesterday's roast heated boiling hot and mellowed by a few spoonfuls of cream or rich milk omelette plain beat six eggs very light the whites to a stiff froth that will stand alone the yolks to a smooth thick batter add to the yolks a small cupful of milk pepper and salt lastly stir in the whites lightly have ready in a hot frying pan a good lump of butter when it hisses pour in your mixture gently and set over a clear fire 
it should cook in ten minutes at most do not stir but contrive as the eggs set to slip a broad bladed knife under the omelet to guard against burning at the bottom the instant hiss of the butter as it flows to the hottest part of the pan will prove the wisdom and efficacy of the precaution if your oven is hot you may put the frying pan into it as soon as the middle of the omelet is set when done lay a hot dish bottom upward on the top of the pan and dexterously upset the latter to bring the browned side of the omelet uppermost eat soon or it will fall i know these directions to be worthy of note i have never seen lighter or better omelets anywhere than in households where these have been the rule for years in the manufacture of this simple and delightful article of food omelet with ham tongue or chicken make precisely as above but when it is done scatter thickly over the surface some minced ham tongue or seasoned chicken slip your broad knife under one side of the omelet and double in half enclosing the meat then upset the frying pan upon a hot dish or you can stir the minced meat into the omelet after all the ingredients are put together adding if you like some chopped parsley cauliflower omelet chop some cold cauliflower very fine and mix in when your omelet is ready to go in the pan season highly with cayenne pepper and salt asparagus omelet is made of the tops only minced and seasoned and stirred in as is the cauliflower tomato omelet has stewed tomatoes spread over the surface and is then doubled in half egg balls for soup rub the yolks of three or four hard-boiled eggs to a smooth paste with a very little melted butter pepper and salt to these add two raw ones beaten light and enough flour to hold the paste together mince into balls with floured hands and set in a cool place until just before your soup comes off when put in carefully and boil one minute omelette au fin herbe after the yolks and whites are mixed together with the milk stir in with two or three strokes of the spoon or whisk two tablespoonfuls of chopped parsley green thyme and sweet marjoram with pepper and salt fry instantly cheese omelets grate some rich old cheese and having mixed the omelet as usual stir in the cheese with a swift turn or two of the whisk and at the same time some chopped parsley and thyme if you beat long the cheese will separate the milk from the eggs cook at once or make the omelet in the usual way grate cheese upon it and fold it over sweet omelets omelet souffle fried six eggs four tablespoonfuls sugar powdered one teaspoonful of vanilla two tablespoonfuls butter beat the whites and yolks separately add the sugar to the yolks a little at a time beating very thoroughly until they are smooth and thick the whites should stand alone put two tablespoonfuls of butter in a frying pan heat to boiling and when you have added the vanilla to the omelet pour it in and cook very quickly as you would a plain one slip the knife frequently under it to loosen from the sides and bottom it is more apt to scorch than an omelet without sugar turn out upon a very hot dish sift powdered sugar over the top and serve instantly or it will fall and become heavy omelet souffle baked six eggs six tablespoonfuls of powdered sugar juice of a lemon and half the peel grated beat yolks and whites separately and very well add to the yolks by degrees the powdered sugar and beat until it ceases to froth and is thick and smooth the whites should be stiff enough to cut with a knife stir together lightly with the seasoning pour into a well buttered dish and bake in a quick oven five or six minutes the dish should be warmed when it is buttered not to chill the eggs send around with a spoon and let each one help himself before it can fall apple omelet six large pippins one tablespoonful butter eight eggs five or six tablespoonfuls sugar nutmeg to taste one teaspoonful rose water stew the apples when you have pared and cored them as for apple sauce beat them very smooth while hot adding the butter sugar and nutmeg when perfectly cold put with the eggs which should be whipped light yolks and whites separately put in the yolks first then the rose water lastly the whites 
and pour into a deep bake dish which has been warmed and buttered bake in a moderate oven until it is delicately browned eat warm not hot for tea with graham bread it is better for children i say nothing of their elders than cake and preserves omelet with jelly currant or other tart jelly five eggs four tablespoonfuls cream or the same of milk thicken with a teaspoonful of rice flour or arrowroot two tablespoonfuls powdered sugar one teaspoonful bitter almond or vanilla flavoring beat whites and yolks separately adding to the latter the sugar and milk after they are thick and smooth next chop in the seasonings lastly stir in the whites with a few swift strokes put a large spoonful of butter in the frying pan and when it is hot pour in the omelet spread upon it when done which will be in a very few minutes some nice jelly take the pan from the fire to do this spread quickly slip your knife or tin spatula under one half of the omelet and double it over turn over on a hot platter sift powdered sugar upon it and eat at once end of section twenty nine section thirty of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harland milk butter cheese etc a cool cellar is the best place in which to keep milk if you have no dairy or milk room strain it into broad shallow pans which are lukewarm from recent scalding you can get them made in one piece with no seams in which sour cream or dirt may lurk unsuspected set upon swing shelves to avoid the possibilities of drowned mice and keep the cellar dark to save it from flies in twelve hours skim for the table and unless you have need of the milk let it stand twelve hours more for the second rising of cream put this into the stone jar or crock in which the cream is kept for churning even in butter making i have found it a good plan to take off at night the cream clean from the morning churning instead of letting it stand twenty-four hours as is the usual custom the second rising will repay one for the additional trouble churn as soon as convenient after the cream loppers or thickens if it stands too long it becomes bitter or musty the churn should be well scalded and aired between the churnings scrupulous cleanliness should be the unbending rule of dairy arrangements all strongly flavored substances must be kept from the neighborhood of milk and butter they are ready absorbents and when they contract odor or taste never get rid of it have earthen and tin milk vessels and never allow them to be put to any other use thaw the churn and cool with ice or spring water pour in the thick cream churn rather fast until the butter flakes left by the dasher upon the top show that the end to be gained is near then more slowly the motion should always be regular in warm weather pour a little cold water into the churn should the butter come slowly take it up with the perforated dasher turning it dexterously just below the surface of the buttermilk to catch every stray bit have ready some clean very cold water in a deep wooden tray and into this plunge the dasher when you draw it from the churn the butter will float off leaving the dasher free having collected every particle gather behind a wooden butter shovel and drain off the water squeezing and pressing the butter with the shovel set in a cool place for an hour to harden a necessary measure in summer then work and knead it with a wooden ladle until not another drop of water exudes and the butter is like yellow marble in polish and closeness of pores when you have worked out the buttermilk add by degrees fine salt in the proportion of a dessert spoonful to every pound then set aside for some hours always in a cool place the last working is a slight affair comparatively still using the paddle and never from beginning to end of the operation touching with your hands 
mold into rolls or pound pats mark with grooves or checkers with the ladle or stamp with a print wrap each roll in a clean wet linen cloth which has no touch of soap or starch about it and pack in a stone jar sprinkling a little salt between the layers if you wish to keep it a long time work with especial care and pack down hard in a perfectly clean stone jar do not above all things take one that has ever been used for pickles you may not detect the faintest odor lingering about it but the butter will and absorb it too some cover the butter with strong brine but a better way is to press a fine linen cloth closely to the surface and cover this with a thick layer of clean fine salt set in a cool dry place and keep the cloth over it all the time also a tightly fitting lid when you begin to use it take out enough to last a week and recover if you admit the air every day it is apt to grow strong a pretty plate of butter for the table is made of balls half the size of an egg rolled in the little fluted paddles sold for the purpose bonny clabber or loppered milk set a china or glass dish of skim milk away in a warm place covered when it turns i e becomes a smooth firm but not tough cake like blanc mange serve in the same dish cut out carefully with a large spoon and put it in saucers with cream powdered sugar and nutmeg to taste it is better if set on the ice for an hour before it is brought to table do not let it stand until the whey separates from the curd few people know how delicious this healthful and cheap dessert can be made if eaten before it becomes tart and tough with a liberal allowance of cream and sugar there are not many jellies and creams superior to it rennet clean the stomach of a calf or have your butcher do it for you as soon as it is killed scouring inside and out with salt when perfectly clean tack upon a frame to dry in the sun for a day cut in squares and pack down in salt or keep in wine or brandy when you wish to use the salted soak half an hour in cold water wash well and put into the milk to be turned tied to a string that it may be drawn out without breaking the curd the liquor rennet sold by druggists is sometimes good quite as often worthless you can however get the dried or salted in the markets and often in the drug stores mountain custard or junket take a piece of rennet an inch long or a teaspoonful of the wine in which rennet is kept to each quart of milk season with vanilla or lemon a little nutmeg and a tablespoonful of sugar to each part more will retard the formation set in a warm place near the fire or on the kitchen table closely covered look at it from time to time and if in the course of an hour there are no signs of stiffening add more rennet when it is firm like blanc mange and before the whey separates from the curd remove the rennet and set upon ice until it is wanted serve with powdered sugar and cream thickened milk boil a quart of milk add a very little salt and two tablespoonfuls of rice or wheat flour wet in cold milk stir in smoothly and let it thicken in a vessel of boiling water keeping the outer saucepan at a hard boil for half an hour eat with butter and sugar or with cream and sugar for invalids or children who are suffering with summer disorders boil at least an hour stirring very often cheese i have doubted the utility of inserting a receipt for regular cheese making the apparatus necessary for the manufacture is seldom if ever found in a private family while cheese can be had in every country store at one-third the expense to an amateur of making it but remembering that it may be a pleasant if not profitable experiment for the mistress of many cows to make at her odd moments i have secured what purports to be an exact description of cheese making on a small scale to each gallon of milk warm from the cow add a piece of rennet six inches long and three wide or two tablespoonfuls rennet water i e water in which rennet has been boiled cover and set in a warm place until it becomes a firm curd this should be at the point not more than three-quarters of an hour 
when the whey has separated entirely and looks clear and greenish wash your hands very clean and with them gently press all the curd to one side of the pan or tub while an assistant dips out the whey have ready a stout linen bag pour the curd into it and hang it up to dry until not another drop of whey can be pressed out then put the curd into a wooden dish and chop it fine empty into a finer bag and put into a small cheese box or other circular wooden box with a perforated bottom and a lid that slides down easily but closely on the inside your bag should be as nearly as possible the same shape and size as this box lay heavy weights upon the top in lack of a cheese press and let it stand an hour the cloth should be wet inside as well as out before you put the curds in at the end of the hour take out the cheese and chop again adding salt this time have ready a fresh wet cloth pack in the curd hard there should be a circular cover for this bag which must be basted all around and very smooth on top scald the box and cover then rinse with cold water and put the cheese again under press for twelve hours next day take it out rub all over with salt and fit on a clean wet cloth look at it sixteen hours later pare off the rough edges and scrape the sides of inequalities before returning to the press for the last time let it remain under the weights for twenty-four hours strip off the cloth rub the cheese well with butter and lay upon a clean cloth spread on a shelf in a cool dry place a wire safe is best wipe clean then rub every day with butter for a week and turn also every twenty-four hours at the end of the week omit the greasing and rub hard with a coarse cloth do this every day for a month your cheese will then be eatable but it will be much finer six months later stilton cheeses renowned over the world are buried in dry heather when they are firm enough to remove from the shelves and kept there a month this is called ripening cottage cheese heat sour milk until the whey rises to the top pour it off put the curd in a bag and let it drip six hours without squeezing it put in a wooden bowl chop fine with a wooden spoon salt to taste and work to the consistency of soft putty adding a little cream and butter as you proceed mold with your hands into round pats or balls and keep in a cool place it is best when fresh cream cheese stir a little salt into a pan of loppered cream pour into a linen bag and let it drain three days changing the bag every day then pack it into a wooden cup or mold with holes in the bottom and press two hours wet the mold with cold water before putting in the cream curd wrapped in soft white paper two or three folds of tissue paper will do to exclude the air they will keep in a cool place for a week this is the cheese sold in this country under the name of neuf chatel end of section thirty Section 31 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Common Sense in the Household, a Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harlan. Bread. If eminence of importance entitled a subject to preeminence of position, that of which we are now about to speak should have stood foremost in this work it is not a pleasant thing to think or write about but it is a stubborn fact that upon thousands of tables in otherwise comfortable homes good bread is an unknown phenomenon i say phenomenon because it would indeed be a marvellous estrangement of cause and effect were indifferent flour unskilfully mixed with flat yeast badly risen and negligently baked to result in that pride of the notable housekeeper light sweet wholesome bread i know a household where sour stiff bread is the rule varied several times during the week by muffins scented and colored with soda clammy biscuit and leathery griddle cakes another where the bread is invariably overrisen and consequently tasteless sometimes slightly acid 
yet another in which homemade bread is not used at all because it is so troublesome and uncertain the mistress preferring to feed her family growing children and all upon the varied colored sponges bought at the baker's sponges inflated with sal volatile flavorless and dry as chips when a day old and too often betraying in the dark streaks running through the interior of the loaf want of cleanliness in the kneader yet these are all well-to-do people who submit to these abominations partly because they do not know how badly off they are chiefly because it is their way of doing and they see no reason for changing i have been a housekeeper for thirty years and have always mixed my bread just so retorted a mistress once when i mildly set forth the advantages of setting a sponge overnight i put in flour yeast and milk if i have it and give them a good stir then set the dough down to rise our folks don't fancy very light bread there don't seem to be any substance in it so to speak mine generally turns out pretty nice it's all luck after all about bread i'm told you have a receipt for making bread laughed another to me i never heard of such a thing in my life and i've been keeping house eighteen years so i thought i'd call and ask you for it just as a curiosity you know i want to see what it is like i wisely kept my thoughts to myself and dictated the receipt which she jotted down in a memorandum book laughing all the while at the excellent joke you really use this she demanded when this was done i do i have used no other for many years and the bread i ate upon your table the other night was made according to this again an affirmative answer i guess your cook could tell another story rejoined the skeptic you can't make me believe that bread is made by rule i put my materials together anyhow and i have as good luck as most of my neighbors i regarded my visitor as an impertinent simpleton but i have been amazed in subsequent years at finding that her creed is that of hundreds of housewives more or less sensible luck rules the baking and upon the shoulders of this invisible are laid the deficiencies of the complacent cook cheap flour and laziness are at the bottom of more mishaps in the bread line than any other combination of circumstances from the inferior grades of flour it is possible to make tolerable biscuit crumpets and muffins plain pastry and very good griddle cakes you cannot by any stretch of art produce excellent bread from poor flour it is no economy to purchase it for this purpose it is judicious to lay in two barrels at a time and to use the best only for the semi or tri-weekly baking chiefest then among the conditions to good bread i place good family flour dry elastic and odorless whiteness is a secondary consideration although to american eyes this is a recommendation a little experience will teach you to detect the signs that foretell satisfactory baking days and vice versa if in handling the flour you discern a heaviness like that of ground plaster if in squeezing a handful tightly you discover that it retains the imprint of palm and fingers and rolls back into the tray a compact ball or roll if it is in the least musty or sour use it very sparingly in your trial baking for the chances are as ten to one that you will head the barrel up again and return it to your grocer sometimes new flour can be ripened for use by sifting enough for each baking into a large tray and exposing it to the hot sun for some hours or by setting it upon the kitchen hearth for the same time and it not unfrequently happens that flour improves greatly after the barrel has been open for several days or weeks it dries out and becomes lighter more elastic next in importance to the quality of the flour is that of the yeast this should be light in color and lively effervescing easily when shaken and emitting an odor like weak ammonia if dull or sour it is bad in cities it is easiest perhaps cheapest to buy yeast from a brewery or bakery exercising your discrimination as to quality unless you can satisfy yourself in this regard you had better make your own i can confidently recommend the receipts given in this work as easy and safe having tried them in my own family 
novices in bread-making and many who should have learned better by long experience fall into a sad mistake in the consistency of the dough it should be mixed as soft as it can be handled bread will rise sooner and higher be lighter and more digestible and keep fresh much longer if this rule be followed stiff bread is close in texture often waxy to the teeth and after a day or so becomes very hard set the dough to rise in a moderately warm place and keep it in an even temperature there is force in the old lament my bread took cold last night cold arrests the process of fermentation there is a chance should this occur that a removal to a more genial atmosphere and careful nursing may cure the congestion should it be only partial too much heat carries forward the work too rapidly in this case you will find your dough puffy and sour correct the latter evil by dissolving a little soda or saleratus in hot water and working it well in knead your bread faithfully and from all sides until it rebounds like india rubber after a smart blow of the fist upon the centre of the mass the oven should not be too hot if you cannot hold your bare arm within it while you count thirty it is too quick keep the heat steady after the bread goes in too much fire at first and rapidly cooling produce the effect upon the bread which is technically called slack baked i e the inside of the loaf is never properly done practice and intelligent observation will in time make you an adept in the management of your ovens if the bread rises rapidly while baking and the crust begins to form before the lower part of the loaf is baked cover the top with clean paper until you are ready to brown it grate away the burned portions of the crust should there be such this is better than chipping with a knife one of the best bread makers i know bakes in round pans each loaf by itself and grates the whole outer surface top bottom and sides quickly and lightly toning down the brown to a uniform and pleasing tint tilt your loaves upon the edge the lower part resting upon the table the upper supported by the wall or other upright object and throw a coarse dry cloth over them until they cool this position allows the air to get at all sides and prevents sweating a tin bread box is best with a cloth at bottom and enwrapping the loaves yeast hop four large potatoes or six small two quarts cold water double handful hops tied in a coarse muslin bag four tablespoonfuls flour two tablespoonfuls white sugar peel the potatoes and put them with the hop bag into a saucepan containing two quarts cold water cover and boil until the potatoes break and fall apart take these out with a perforated skimmer leaving the water still boiling mash them fine with a potato beetle and work in the flour and sugar moisten this gradually with the boiling hop tea stirring it to a smooth paste when all the tea has been mixed in set it aside to cool while still slightly warm add four tablespoonfuls of lively yeast and turn all into a large open vessel to work keep this in a warm place until it ceases to bubble up or until next day in summer it will work well in a few hours when quite light put in earthen jars with small mouths in which fit corks or bottle it and remove to ice-house or cellar it will keep good for a fortnight longer in winter when you wish to use it for baking send a small vessel to the cellar for the desired quantity and recork at once a half hour in a hot kitchen may spoil it yeast self-working eight potatoes two ounces hops four quarts cold water one pound flour one half pound white sugar one tablespoonful salt tie the hops in a coarse muslin bag and boil one hour in four quarts of water let it cool to lukewarmness before removing the bag wet with the tepid liquor a little at a time the flour making to a smooth paste put in the sugar and salt beat up the batter three minutes before adding the rest of the tea set it away for two days in an open bowl covered with a thin cloth in a closet which is moderately and evenly warm on the third day 
peel boil and mash the potatoes and when entirely free from lumps and specks stir in gradually the thickened hop liquor let it stand twelve hours longer in the bowl stirring often and keeping it in the warm kitchen then bottle or put away in corked jars which must be perfectly sweet and freshly scalded this will keep a month in a cool cellar it is more troublesome to make it than other kinds of yeast but it needs no other rising to excite fermentation and remains good longer than that made in the usual way yeast potato six potatoes two quarts cold water four tablespoonfuls flour two tablespoonfuls white sugar peel and boil the potatoes until they break leaving the water on the fire take them out and mash fine with the flour and sugar wetting gradually with the hot water until it is all used when lukewarm add a gill of good yeast and set aside in an open vessel and warm place to ferment when it ceases to effervesce bottle and set in ice-house this yeast is very nice and white and is preferred by many who dislike the bitter taste of hops it is also convenient to make when hops cannot be obtained yeast cakes two quarts cold water one quart pared and sliced potatoes double handful hops tied in coarse muslin bag flour to make stiff batter one cup indian meal boil the potatoes and hop bag in two quarts of water for three quarters of an hour remove the hops and while boiling hot strain the potatoes and water through a colander into a bowl stir into the scalding liquor enough flour to make a stiff batter beat all up well add two tablespoonfuls lively yeast and set in a warm place to rise when light stir in a cup of indian meal roll into a sheet a quarter of an inch thick and cut into round cakes dry these in the hot sun or in a very moderate oven taking care they do not heat to baking it is best to put them in after the fire has gone down for the night and leave them in until morning when entirely dry and cold hang them up in a bag in a cool dry place use one cake three inches in diameter for a loaf of fair size soak in tepid water until soft and add a pinch of soda or saleratus then mix these cakes will remain good a month in summer two in winter baking powders one ounce supercarbonate soda seven drachms tartaric acid in powder roll smoothly and mix thoroughly keep in a tight glass jar or bottle use one teaspoonful to a quart of flour or twelve teaspoonfuls carbonate soda twenty four teaspoonfuls cream tartar put as above and use in like proportion bread sponge potato six potatoes boiled and mashed fine while hot six tablespoonfuls baker's yeast two tablespoonfuls white sugar two tablespoonfuls lard one even teaspoonful soda one quart warm not hot water three cups flour mash the potatoes and work in the lard and sugar stir to a cream mixing in gradually a quart of the water in which the potatoes were boiled which should have been poured out to cool down to blood warmth beat in the flour already wet up with a little potato water to prevent lumping then the yeast lastly the soda cover lightly if the weather is warm more closely in winter and set to rise overnight in a warm place bread sponge plain one quart warm water six tablespoonfuls baker's yeast two tablespoonfuls lard two tablespoonfuls white sugar one teaspoonful soda flour to make a soft batter melt the lard in the warm water add the sugar then the flour by degrees stirring in smoothly a quart and a pint of flour will usually be sufficient if the quality is good next comes the yeast lastly the soda beat up hard for several minutes and set to rise as above bread mixed with potato sponge is more nutritious keeps fresh longer and is sweeter than that made with the plainer sponge but there are certain seasons of the year when good old potatoes cannot be procured and new ones will not do for this purpose the potato sponge is safer because surer for beginners in the important art of bread making after using it for fifteen years 
i regard it as almost infallible given the conditions of good flour yeast kneading and baking family bread white having set your sponge overnight or if you bake late in the afternoon early in the morning sift dry flour into a deep bread tray and strew a few spoonfuls of fine salt over it the question of the quantity of flour is a delicate one requiring judgment and experience various brands of flour are so unequal with respect to the quantity of gluten they contain that it is impossible to give any invariable rule on this subject it will be safe however to sift two quarts and a pint if you have set the potato sponge two quarts for the plain this will make two good-sized loaves make a hole in the middle of the heap pour in the risen sponge which should be very light and seamed in many places on the top and work down the flour into it with your hands if too soft add more flour if you can mould it at all it is not too soft if stiff rinse out the bowl in which the sponge was set with a little lukewarm water and work this in when you have it in manageable shape begin to knead work the mass into a ball your hands having been well floured from the first detach it from the tray and lift it in your left hand while you sprinkle flour with the right thickly over the bottom and sides of the tray toss back the ball into this and knead hard always toward the centre of the mass which should be repeatedly turned over and around that every portion may be manipulated brisk and long kneading makes the pores fine and regular gaping holes of diverse sizes are an unerring tell-tale of a careless cook spend at least twenty minutes half an hour is better in this kind of useful gymnastics it is grand exercise for arms and chest this done work the dough into a shapely ball in the centre of the tray sprinkle flour over the top throw a cloth over all and leave it on the kitchen table to rise taking care it is not in a draught of cold air in summer it will rise in four or five hours in winter six are often necessary it should come up steadily until it at least trebles its original bulk and the floured surface cracks all over knead again for ten or fifteen minutes then divide it into as many parts as you wish loaves and put these in well greased pans for the final rising in a large household baking it is customary to mould the dough into oblong rolls three or four according to the number of loaves you desire and to lay these close together in one large pan the second kneading is done upon a floured board and should be thorough as the first the dough being continually shifted and turned set the pans in a warm place for an hour longer with a cloth thrown over them to keep out the air and dust then bake heeding the directions set down in the article upon bread in general if your ovens are in good condition one hour should bake the above quantity of bread but here again experience must be your guide note carefully for yourself how long a time is required for your first successful baking as also how much dry flour you have worked into your sponge and let these data regulate future action i have known a variation of two quarts in a large baking over the usual measure of flour i need not tell you that you had better shun a brand that requires such an excessive quantity to bring the dough to the right consistency it is neither nutritious nor economical when you make out the loaves prick the top with the fork do not make your first baking too large practice is requisite to the management of an unwieldy mass of dough let your trial loaf be widths say half the quantity of sponge and flour i have set down and increase these as skill and occasion require carefully preserving the proportions seven or eight quarts of flour will be needed for the semi-weekly baking of a family of moderate size if i have seemed needlessly minute in the directions i have laid down it is because i wish to be a guide not a betrayer and because i am deeply impressed with the worth of such advice as may tend to diminish the number of those who know not for themselves the comfort and delight of eating from day to day and year to year good family bread family bread brown i wish it were in my power by much and earnest speaking and writing 
to induce every housekeeper to make brown bread that is bread made of unbolted usually called graham flour a staple article of diet in her family i only repeat the declaration of a majority of our best chemists and physicians when i say that our american fondness for fine white bread is a serious injury to our health we bolt and rebolt our flour until we extract from it three-quarters of its nutritive qualities leaving little strength in it except what lies in gluten or starch and consign that which makes bone and tissue which regulates the digestive organs and leaves the blood pure the brain clear to the lower animals growing children especially should eat brown bread daily it supplies the needed phosphate to the tender teeth and bones if properly made it soon commends itself to their taste and white becomes insipid in comparison dyspeptics have long been familiar with its dietetic virtues and were the use of it more general we should have fewer wretches to mourn over the destroyed coats of their stomachs it is wholesome sweet honest and should be popular prepare a sponge as for white bread using potatoes or white flour my rule is to take out a certain quantity of the risen sponge on baking day and set aside for brown bread put into a tray two parts graham flour one-third white and to every quart of this allow a handful of indian meal with a teaspoonful of salt wet this up with the sponge and when it is mixed add for a loaf of fair size half a teacupful of molasses the dough should be very soft if there is not enough of the sponge to reduce it to the desired consistency add a little blood warm water knead it diligently and long it will not rise so rapidly as the white flour having more body to carry let it take its time make into round comfortable loaves and set down again for the second rising when you have again kneaded it bake steadily taking care it does not burn and do not cut while hot the result will well repay you for your trouble it will take a longer time to bake than white bread brown flour should not be sifted boston brown bread set a sponge over night with potatoes or white flour in the following proportions one cup yeast six potatoes mashed fine with three cups of flour one quart warm water two tablespoonfuls lard or if you leave out the potatoes one quart of warm water to three pints of flour two tablespoonfuls brown sugar beat up well and let it rise five or six hours when light sift into the bread tray one quart rye flour two quarts indian meal one tablespoonful salt one teaspoonful soda or saleratus mix this up very soft with a risen sponge adding warm water if needed and working in gradually half a teacup full of molasses knead well and let it rise from six to seven hours then work over again and divide into loaves putting these in well greased round deep pans the second rising should last an hour at the end of which time bake in a moderate oven about four hours rapid baking will ruin it if put in late in the day let it stay in the oven all night rye bread set a sponge as above but with half the quantity of water in the morning mix with this one quart warm milk one tablespoonful salt one cup indian meal and enough rye flour to make it into pliable dough proceed as with wheat bread baking it a little longer it is a mistake to suppose that acidity greater or less is the normal state of rye bread if you find your dough in the slightest degree sour correct by adding a teaspoonful of soda dissolved in warm water it is safest to add this always in warm weather milk bread one quart of milk one half teacupful of yeast one quarter pound butter one tablespoonful white sugar stir into the milk which should be made blood warm a pint of flour the sugar lastly the yeast beat all together well and let them rise five or six hours then melt the butter and add with a little salt work in flour enough to make a stiff dough let this rise four hours and make into small loaves set near the fire for half an hour and bake in warm weather add a teaspoonful of soda dissolved in warm water to the risen sponge as all bread mixed with milk 
is apt to sour buttermilk bread one pint buttermilk heated to scalding stir in while it is hot enough flour to make a tolerably thick batter add half a gill of yeast and let it rise five or six hours if you make it overnight you need not add the yeast but put in instead a tablespoonful of white sugar in the morning stir into the sponge a tablespoonful of soda dissolved in hot water a little salt and two tablespoonfuls melted butter work in just flour enough to enable you to handle the dough comfortably knead well make into loaves and let it rise until light this makes very white and wholesome bread rice bread make a sponge of one quart warm water one teacupful yeast one tablespoonful white sugar two tablespoonfuls lard one quart wheat flour beat well together and when it has risen which will be in about five hours add three pints of warm milk and three teacupfuls rice flour wet to a thin paste with cold milk and boiled four minutes as you would starch this should be a little more than blood warm when it is stirred into the batter if not thick enough to make out into dough add a little wheat flour knead thoroughly and treat as you would wheat bread in the matter of the two risings and baking this is nice and delicate for invalids and keeps well if you cannot procure the rice flour boil one cup of whole rice to a thin paste mashing and beating it smooth end of section thirty one section thirty two of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harlan french rolls number one in kneading dough for the day's baking after adding and working in the risen sponge set aside enough for a loaf of tea rolls work into this a heaping tablespoonful of lard or butter and let it stand in a tolerably cool place not a cold or draughty one for four hours knead it again and let it alone for three hours longer then make into rolls by rolling out very lightly pieces of the dough into round cakes and folding these not quite in the centre like turnovers the third rising will be for one hour then bake steadily half an hour or less if the oven is quick having seen these rolls smoking light and delicious upon my own table at least twice a week for ten years with scarcely a failure in the mixing or baking i can confidently recommend the receipt and the product you can make out part of your graham dough in the same manner french rolls number two one quart milk new warm milk is best one teacup yeast one quart and a pint of flour when this sponge is light work in a well-beaten egg and two tablespoonfuls melted butter with a teaspoonful of salt half a teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one tablespoonful white sugar and enough white flour to make a soft dough let this stand four or five hours roll out into round cakes and fold as in number one or shape with your hands into balls set these closely together in the baking pan let them rise one hour and just before putting them into the oven cut deeply across each ball with a sharp knife this will make the cleft roll so familiar to us in french restaurants bake half an hour risen biscuit one quart milk three-fourths cup lard or butter half and half is a good rule three-quarter cup of yeast two tablespoonfuls white sugar one teaspoonful salt flour to make a soft dough mix overnight warming the milk slightly and melting the lard or butter in the morning roll out into a sheet three-quarters of an inch in thickness cut into round cakes set these closely together in a pan let them rise for twenty minutes and bake twenty minutes these delightful biscuits are even better if the above ingredients be set with half as much flour in the form of a thin sponge and the rest of the flour be worked in five hours later let this rise five hours more and proceed as already directed this is the best plan if the biscuits are intended for tea 
sally lunn number one one quart of flour four eggs one half cup melted butter one cup warm milk one cup warm water four tablespoonfuls yeast one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water beat the eggs to a stiff froth add the milk water butter soda and salt stir in the flour to a smooth batter and beat the yeast in well set to rise in a buttered pudding dish in which it must be baked and sent to table or if you wish to turn it out set to rise in a well buttered mould it will not be light under six hours bake steadily three quarters of an hour or until a straw thrust into it comes up clean eat while hot this is the genuine old-fashioned sally lunn and will hardly give place even yet to the newer and faster compounds known under the same name sally lunn number two one scant quart flour four eggs one teacupful milk one teacupful lard and butter mixed one teaspoonful cream tartar one half teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one teaspoonful salt beat the eggs very light yolks and whites separately melt the shortening sift the cream tartar into the flour add the whites the last thing potato biscuit eight potatoes of medium size mashed very fine four tablespoonfuls butter melted two cups milk blood warm one cup yeast flour to make a thin batter two tablespoonfuls white sugar stir all the above ingredients together except the butter and let the sponge rise until light four or five hours will do then add the melted butter with a little salt and flour enough to make soft dough set aside this for four hours longer roll out in a sheet three-quarters of an inch thick cut into cakes let these rise one hour and bake mrs e s biscuit soda one quart flour two heaping tablespoonfuls of lard two cups sweet if you can get it new milk one teaspoonful soda two teaspoonful cream tartar one saltspoonful of salt rub the soda and cream tartar into the flour and sift all together before they are wet then put them in the salt next the lard rubbed into the prepared flour quickly and lightly lastly pour in the milk work out the dough rapidly kneading with as few strokes as possible since handling injures the biscuit if properly prepared the dough will have a rough surface and the biscuit be flaky the dough should also be very soft if the flour stiffen it too much add more milk roll out lightly cut into cakes at least half an inch thick and bake in a quick oven the biscuit made by the friend from whom i had this receipt were marvels of lightness and sweetness i have often thought of them since with regretful longing when set down to so-called soda biscuit marbled with greenish yellow streaks and emitting when split an odor which was in itself an eloquent dissuasive to an educated appetite few cooks make really good quick biscuit why i am unable to say unless upon the principle of brains will tell i have had more than one in my kitchen who admirable in almost every other respect were absolutely unfit to be entrusted with this simple yet delicate manufacture the common fault is to have too heavy a hand with soda and to guess at the quantities instead of measuring them eat while warm graham biscuit three cups graham flour one cup white flour three cups milk two tablespoonfuls lard one heaping tablespoonful white sugar one saltspoonful of salt one teaspoonful of soda two teaspoonfuls cream tartar mix and bake as you do the white soda biscuit mrs e s they are good cold as well as hot minute biscuit one pint sour or buttermilk one teaspoonful soda two teaspoonfuls melted butter flour to make soft dough just stiff enough to handle mix roll and cut out rapidly with as little handling as may be and bake in a quick oven graham wheatlets one pint graham flour nearly a quart of boiling water or milk one teaspoonful salt scald the flour when you have salted it into as soft dough as you can handle roll it nearly an inch thick cut in round cakes lay upon a hot buttered tin or pan and bake them in the hottest oven you can get ready everything depends upon heat in the manufacture of these some cooks spread them on a hot tin and set this upon a red-hot stove 
properly scalded and cooked they are as light as puffs and very good otherwise they are flat and tough split and butter while hot sweet rusk one pint warm milk one half cup of butter one cup of sugar two eggs one teaspoonful of salt two tablespoonfuls yeast make a sponge with the milk yeast and enough flour for a thin batter and let it rise over night in the morning add the butter eggs and sugar previously beaten up well together the salt and flour enough to make a soft dough mold with the hands into balls of uniform size set close together in a pan and let them rise until very light after baking wash the tops with a clean soft cloth dipped in molasses and water dried rusk one pint of warm milk two eggs one half teacup of butter half a cup of yeast one teaspoonful salt set a sponge with these ingredients leaving out the eggs and stirring in flour until you have a thick batter early next morning add the well-beaten eggs and flour enough to enable you to roll out the dough let this rise in the bread bowl two hours roll into a sheet nearly an inch thick cut into round cakes and arrange in your baking pan two deep laying one upon the other carefully let these stand for another half hour and bake these are now very nice for eating and you may if you like reserve a plateful for tea but the rule for the many handed down through i am afraid to say how many generations in the family where i first ate this novel and delightful biscuit is to divide the twins thus leaving one side of each cake soft and piling them loosely in the pan set them in the oven when the fire is declining for the night and leave them in until morning then still obeying the traditions of revered elders put them in a clean muslin bag and hang them up in the kitchen they will be fit to eat upon the third day put as many as you need in a deep dish and pour over them iced milk or water if you cannot easily procure the former let them soak until soft take them out drain them for a minute in a shallow plate and eat with butter invalids and children crave them eagerly indeed i have seen few refuse them who had ever tasted them before there is a pastoral flavor about the pleasant dish eaten with the accompaniment of fresh berries on a summer evening that appeals to the better impulses of one's appetite try my soaked rusk not forgetting to ice the milk and you will find out for yourself what i mean but cannot quite express dried rusk will keep for weeks and grow better every day the only risk is in their being eaten up before they attain maturity butter crackers one quart of flour three tablespoonfuls butter one half teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one saltspoonful salt two cups sweet milk rub the butter into the flour or what is better cut it up with a knife or chopper as you do in pastry add the salt milk and soda mixing well work into a ball lay upon a floured board and beat with a rolling pin half an hour turning and shifting the mass often roll into an even sheet a quarter of an inch thick or less prick deeply with a fork and bake hard in a moderate oven hang them up in a muslin bag in the kitchen for two days to dry wafers one pound of flour two tablespoonfuls butter a little salt mix with sweet milk into a stiff dough roll out very thin cut into round cakes and again roll these as thin as they can be handled lift them carefully lay in a pan and bake very quickly these are extremely nice especially for invalids they should be hardly thicker than writing paper flour the baking pan instead of greasing crumpets sweet one pint raised dough three eggs three tablespoonfuls butter one half cup white sugar when your bread is past its second rising work into the above-named quantity the melted butter then the eggs and sugar beaten together until very light bake in muffin rings about twenty minutes crumpets plain three cups warm milk one half cup yeast two tablespoonfuls melted butter one saltspoonful salt and the same of soda dissolved in hot water flour to make good batter set these ingredients leaving out the butter and soda as a sponge when very light beat in the melted butter with a very little flour to prevent the butter from thinning the batter too much stir in the soda hard 
fill patty pans or muffin rings with the mixture and let them stand fifteen minutes before baking this is an excellent easy and economical receipt graham muffins three cups graham flour one cup white flour one quart of milk three quarter cup yeast one tablespoonful lard or butter one teaspoonful salt two tablespoonful sugar set to rise overnight and bake in muffin rings twenty minutes in a quick oven eat hot queen muffins one quart of milk three quarter cup of yeast two tablespoonfuls white sugar one tablespoonful of lard or butter one teaspoonful salt flour to make a good batter four eggs set the batter leaving out the eggs to rise over night in the morning beat the eggs very light stir into the batter and bake in muffin rings twenty minutes in a quick oven cream muffins one quart sweet milk half cream if you can get it one quart flour heaping six eggs one tablespoonful butter and the same of lard melted together beat the eggs light the yolks and whites separately add the milk with a little salt then the shortening lastly the flour stirring in lightly bake immediately in well greased rings half filled with the batter your oven should be hot and the muffins sent to table so soon as they are taken up buttermilk muffins one quart buttermilk or loppered sweet milk two eggs one teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one teaspoonful salt flour to make good batter beat the eggs well and stir them into the milk beating hard all the while add the flour and salt and at the last the soda bake at once in a quick oven mother's muffins one pint milk one egg one tablespoonful lard one half cup yeast flour for stiff batter one teaspoonful salt set to rise overnight charlotte muffins one quart of flour three eggs the whites and yolks beaten separately and until stiff three cups of milk if sour no disadvantage if soda be added a little salt the excellence of these depends upon thorough beating and quick baking rice muffins one cup cold boiled rice one pint of flour two eggs one quart of milk or enough to make thin batter one tablespoonful lard or butter one teaspoonful salt beat hard and bake quickly hominy muffins two cups fine hominy boiled and cold three eggs three cups sour milk if sweet add one teaspoonful cream tartar one half cup melted butter two teaspoonfuls salt two tablespoonfuls white sugar one large cup flour one teaspoonful soda beat the hominy smooth stir in the milk then the butter salt and sugar next the eggs which should first be well beaten then the soda dissolved in hot water lastly the flour there are no more delicious or wholesome muffins than these if rightly mixed and quickly baked bell's muffins three pints of flour one quart of milk two eggs two tablespoonfuls cream tartar one tablespoonful soda one tablespoonful salt sift the cream tartar with the flour beat the eggs very light dissolve the soda in hot water bake in rings in a quick oven end of section thirty two section thirty three of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by claudia salto common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marian harland bread muffins graham muffins three cups graham flour one cup white flour one quart of milk three quarter cup yeast a tablespoonful lard or butter a teaspoonful salt two tablespoonfuls sugar set to rise overnight and bake in muffin rings twenty minutes in a quick oven eat hot queen muffins one quart of milk three quarter cup of yeast two tablespoonfuls white sugar 
one tablespoonful of lard or butter one teaspoonful salt flour to make a good batter four eggs set the batter leaving out the eggs to rise overnight in the morning beat the eggs very light stir into the batter and bake in muffin rings twenty minutes in a quick oven cream muffins one quart sweet milk half cream if you can get it one quart flour heaping six eggs one tablespoonful butter and the same of lard melted together beat the eggs light the yolks and whites separately add the milk with a little salt then the shortening lastly the flour stirring in lightly bake immediately in well greased rings half filled with the batter your oven should be hot and the muffins sent to table so soon as they are taken up buttermilk muffins one quart buttermilk or loppert sweet milk two eggs one teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one teaspoonful salt flour to make a good batter beat the eggs well and stir them into the milk beating hard all the while add the flour and salt and at the last the soda bake at once in a quick oven mother's muffins one pint milk one egg one tablespoonful lard a half cup yeast flour for stiff batter one teaspoonful salt set to rise overnight charlotte muffins one quart of flour three eggs the whites and yolks beaten separately and until stiff three cups of milk if sour no disadvantage if soda be added a little salt the excellence of these depends upon thorough beating and quick baking rice muffins one cup cold boiled rice one pint of flour two eggs one quart of milk or enough to make thin batter one tablespoonful lard or butter one teaspoonful salt beat hard and bake quickly hominy muffins two cups fine hominy boiled and cold three eggs three cups sour milk if sweet add one teaspoonful cream tartar a half cup melted butter two teaspoonfuls salt two tablespoonfuls white sugar one large cup flour one teaspoonful soda beat the hominy smooth stir in the milk then the butter salt and sugar next the eggs which should first be well beaten then the soda dissolved in hot water lastly the flour there are no more delicious or wholesome muffins than these if rightly mixed and quickly baked bell's muffins three pints of flour one quart of milk two eggs two tablespoonfuls cream tartar one teaspoonful soda one teaspoonful salt sift the cream tartar with the flour beat the eggs very light dissolve the soda in hot water bake in rings in a quick oven end of section thirty three section thirty four of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harlan cornbread there is a marked difference between the cornmeal ground at the south and that which is sent out from northern mills if any one doubts this it is not she who has perseveringly tried both kinds 
and demonstrated to her own conviction that the same treatment will not do for them an intelligent lady once told me that the shape of the particles composing the meal was different the one being round and smooth the other angular i am inclined to believe this the southern meal is certainly coarser and the bread made from it less compact moreover there is a partiality at the north for yellow meal which the southerners regard as only fit for chicken and cattle feed the yellow may be the sweeter but i acknowledge that i have never succeeded in making really nice bread from it indian meal should be purchased in small quantities except for a very large family it is apt to heat mould and grow musty if kept long in bulk or in a warm place if not sweet and dry it is useless to expect good bread or cakes as an article of diet especially in the early warm days of spring it is healthful and agreeable often acting as a gentle corrective to bile and other disorders in winter also it is always acceptable upon the breakfast or supper table being warming and nutritious in summer the free use of it is less judicious on account of its laxative properties as a kindly variation in the routine of fine white bread and baker's rolls it is worth the attention of every housewife john and the children will like it if it approximates the fair standard of excellence and i take it my good friend you who have patiently kept company with me from our prefatory talk until now that you love them well enough to care for their comfort and likings my husband is wild about cornbread a wife remarked to me not a hundred years ago but i won't make it for him it is such a bother and if i once indulge him he will give me no peace beloved sister i am persuaded better things of you good husbands cannot be spoiled by petting bad ones cannot be made worse they may be made better it seems a little thing so trifling in its consequences you need not tire further your aching back and feet to accomplish it the preparation of john's favorite dish when he does not expect the treat to surprise him when he comes in cold and hungry by setting before him a dish of hot milk toast or a loaf of cornbread brown and crisp without yellow and spongy within instead of the stereotyped pile of cold slices brown or white if he were consulted he would say like the generous soul he is don't take one needless step for me dear and he would mean it but for all that he will enjoy your little surprise ay and love you the better for it it is the little by little that makes up the wheel and woe of life may i make this digression longer yet by telling you what i overheard a husband say to a wife the other day when he thought no one else was near enough to hear him he is no gourmand but he is very partial to a certain kind of crueller which nobody else can make he thinks so well as his little wife it so chanced that in frying some of them she scalded her hand badly after it was bandaged she brought up a plate of the cakes for luncheon he looked at them then at her with a loving mournful smile i can understand now said he how david felt when his men of war brought him the water from the well of bethlehem then he stooped and kissed the injured fingers yet he has been married twenty years i was not ashamed that my eyes were moist i honored him the more that his were dim this is my lesson by the wayside apropos to cornbread and now again to business receipts for bread made of northern indian meal nonpareil cornbread two heaping cups of indian meal one cup of flour three eggs two and a half cups milk one tablespoonful lard two tablespoonfuls white sugar one teaspoonful soda two tablespoonfuls cream tartar one tablespoonful salt beat the eggs very thoroughly whites and yolks separately melt the lard sift the cream tartar and soda into the meal and flour while yet dry and stir this in at the last then to borrow the direction scribbled by a rattle-tongued girl upon the above receipt when she sent it to me beat like mad bake quickly and steadily in a buttered mould half an hour will usually suffice in cutting cornbread hold the knife perpendicularly and cut toward you cornmeal muffins mix according to the foregoing receipt only a little thinner and bake in rings or small patty pans 
all kinds of cornbread should be baked quickly and eaten while hot risen cornbread one pint indian meal two cups risen sponge taken from your regular baking of wheat bread one half cup molasses or what is better four tablespoonfuls white sugar one teaspoonful soda dissolved in hot water one tablespoonful lard melted one cup flour or enough for stiff batter mix well put to rise in a buttered mould until very light bake one hour it is well to scald the meal and stir in while blood warm steamed cornbread two cups indian meal one cup flour two tablespoonfuls white sugar two and a half cups loppered milk or buttermilk one teaspoonful soda one teaspoonful salt one heaping tablespoonful lard melted beat very hard and long put in buttered mould tie a coarse cloth tightly over it and if you have no steamer fit the mould in the top of a pot of boiling water taking care it does not touch the surface of the liquid lay a close cover over the cloth tied about the mould to keep in all the heat steam one hour and a half and set in an oven ten minutes turn out upon a hot plate and eat while warm this will do for a plain dessert eaten with pudding sauce corn meal crumpets one quart indian meal one quart boiled milk four tablespoonfuls yeast two tablespoonfuls white sugar two heaping tablespoonfuls lard or butter or half and half one salt spoonful salt scald the meal with the boiling milk and let it stand until lukewarm then stir in the sugar yeast and salt and leave it to rise five hours add the melted shortening beat well put in greased muffin rings set these near the fire for fifteen minutes and bake half an hour in a quick oven ought to cook them never cut open a muffin or crumpet of any kind least of all one made of indian meal pass the knife lightly around it to pierce the crust then break open with the fingers receipts for cornbread made of southern indian meal johnny cake one teacupful sweet milk one teacupful buttermilk one teaspoonful salt one teaspoonful soda one tablespoonful melted butter enough meal to enable you to roll it into a sheet half an inch thick spread upon a buttered tin or in a shallow pan and bake forty minutes as soon as it begins to brown baste it with a rag tied to a stick and dipped in melted butter repeat this five or six times until it is brown and crisp break not cut it up and eat for luncheon or tea accompanied by sweet or buttermilk aunt jenny's johnny cake mix as above knead well and bake upon a perfectly clean and sweet board before a hot fire with something at the back to keep it up incline at such an angle as will prevent the cake from slipping off until it is hardened slightly by baking then place upright baste frequently with butter until nicely crisp batter bread or egg bread half a cup cold boiled rice two eggs two cups indian meal one tablespoonful lard or butter one teaspoonful salt one pint milk beat the eggs light and the rice to a smooth batter in the milk melt the shortening stir all together very hard and bake in shallow tins very quickly risen cornbread mix a tolerably stiff dough of cornmeal and boiling water a little salt and a tablespoonful butter let it stand four or five hours until light make into small loaves and bake rather quickly cornmeal pone one quart indian meal one teaspoonful salt a little lard melted cold water to make a soft dough mold with the hands into thin oblong cakes lay in a well-greased pan and bake very quickly the common way is to mold into oval mounds higher in the middle than at the ends shaping these rapidly and lightly with the hands by tossing the dough over and over this is done with great dexterity by the virginia cooks and this cornmeal pone forms a part of every dinner it is broken not cut and eaten very hot ash cake is mixed as above a clean spot is swept upon the hot hearth the bread put down and covered with hot wood ashes it must be washed and wiped dry before it is eaten a neater way is to lay a cabbage leaf above and below the pone the bread is thus steamed before it is baked and is made ready for eating by stripping off the leaves fried pone 
instead of moulding the dough with the hands cut into slices with a knife try out some fat pork in a frying pan and fry the slices in the gravy thus obtained to a light brown end of section thirty four